Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP DMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. presenter, uh, Jordan Jenrett, is the PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy Resident at the University of Colorado Skaggs School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. In the journal article that she will be presenting today uh, is titled Prophylactic Levoteracetam and Spontaneous ICH, the PEACH Trial. Uh, so Jordan, whenever you are ready, um, feel free to share your screen and go ahead and get us started. Thank you for that introduction, Kyle and Kelly. And today we will be talking about the use of prophylactic levoteracetam in spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage, otherwise known as the PEACH trial. This trial was originally published in the Lancet Neurology at the beginning of this month and is the first randomized control trial really looking at the use of levoteracetam or Keppra, as I'll refer to it for this presentation, in spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage patient populations. So we know that in spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage uh, patient populations do have really high morbidity and mortality rates. Up to 60% of patients will experience either severe disability or death as a result of their intracerebral hemorrhage. A known complication of intracerebral hemorrhage includes seizures, and these seizures can be delineated based on um, like the time of occurrence after the intracerebral hemorrhage. Acute symptomatic seizures are seizures that occur within seven days of stroke, where Six to 15% of patients will experience clinical seizures or the type of seizures that we sort of think of when the word seizure comes to mind, where patients are having generalized tonic-clonic movements. However, the incidence of seizures will actually increase to 30% once we think about including subclinical seizures or seizures that are documented on EEG monitoring. The majority of seizures will occur within the initial 24 to 72 hours after having an intracerebral hemorrhage. So that's just to say that a lot of these seizures do occur pretty soon after that initial insult to the brain. Seizures are a concern because we do know that seizures can increase metabolic demand, reduce cerebral blood flow, and increase midline shift, all of which are aspects that do potentially worsen a patient's functional and neurologic outcomes after having a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. With all of that being said, it goes to kind of say that it's not totally unrealistic that we would think about primary prophylaxis in this patient setting. However, we do have two um, professional organization guidelines that make a recommendation on the use of primary prophylaxis in intracerebral hemorrhage. The first professional organization is the European Stroke Organization, and they have guidelines for the management of post-stroke seizures and epilepsy. And they state that primary anti-epileptic prophylaxis is really not recommended due to just an overall lack of evidence, a lack of just strong benefit in this patient population. Similarly, our 2022 American Heart Association and American Stroke Association guidelines for the management of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage also state um, that primary prophylaxis does not improve long-term seizure control or functional outcomes. And so the recommendation is also not a strong recommendation for starting primary prophylaxis in this setting. So to continue talking about the clinical controversy in seizure management, um, there really is not a well-defined relationship between seizures and functional outcomes after having an intracerebral hemorrhage. And there's just not a very strong knowledge base of if having a seizure definitively states that a patient will have worse functional outcomes after having that seizure. That being said, there have been some small retrospective studies that have evaluated the role of primary prophylaxis in this patient population. Phenytoin prophylaxis was evaluated, and there was a study published in Stroke Journal in 2009 that showed that the use of phenytoin prophylaxis increased the incidence of fever in this patient population and worsened overall functional outcomes. Valproic acid was also evaluated for primary prophylaxis, and there was found to be no difference in mortality and no difference in seizure control when compared to, to placebo. That brings us to levoteracetam or Keppra prophylaxis. And Keppra has a very favorable safety profile. Um, there's not a concern of drug interactions. It's very well tolerated. And so it's kind of become the forefront of potentially being used as a primary prophylactic agent. However, there hasn't been consistent harm or benefit shown in current studies. 
And so what are those current studies? Um, we have two retrospective studies that look at the use of Keppra in the primary prophylaxis setting for intracerebral hemorrhage. The first was published in 2015 in Stroke Journal, and this was a retrospective subgroup analysis of the ERICH trial. This was a trial that looked at like different factors that would potentially worsen a patient's um, outcomes at the three-month mark after having an intracerebral hemorrhage. And this retrospective study looked at all of the patients that received primary prophylaxis with an anti-epileptic medication. Almost 90% of those patients received Keppra as prophylaxis, and they did exclude patients that had a prior seizure history or seizures in the acute setting. This study found that Keppra was not independently associated with poor outcome or an MRS score of greater than or equal to four at three months. And that was followed by a study in 2017, which was another retrospective study published in the Journal of Neurocritical Care, where 97% of the patients that they looked at for primary prophylaxis received Keppra. So again, not a Keppra-specific study, but um, an overwhelming majority of patients did receive uh, prophylaxis with Keppra. They excluded patients that had an intracerebral hemorrhage as a secondary process to some kind of primary process like trauma, aneurysm, encephalitis, brain tumor, um, a hemorrhagic conversion of an ischemic stroke, or a history of seizure. This study also found that prophylactic anticonvulsant use was not associated with worse functional outcomes or an MRS score of greater than or equal to four. So from these two studies, these two retrospective studies, we essentially have data that suggests that the use of Keppra as a primary prophylactic agent doesn't worsen outcomes, but we don't have great data that looks at the efficacy or the benefit of using Keppra in this setting. That brings us to the PEACH trial, which was published at the beginning of this month and evaluated the safety and efficacy of prophylactic Keppra for the prevention of epileptic seizures in the acute phase of intracerebral hemorrhage. The researchers of this study hypothesized that prophylactic Keppra would reduce the risk of early clinical and electrographic seizures in the acute, non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage. For this study, the design was a parallel group, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled phase three trial, and they essentially included patients that were adult patients with a spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage of the supratentorial region that had presented within 24 hours of their symptom onset. They did exclude patients that had a severe stroke, which was shown by an NIHSS score of greater than 25. They also excluded patients that had an intracerebral hemorrhage either due to trauma, vascular malformation, a hemorrhagic transformation of ischemic stroke or tumor, or had a history of epilepsy or the use of anti-epileptics at baseline. When breaking down the two like patient populations or the two study groups of this um, trial, the first group received placebo for the entire duration of the trial. The second group received Keppra as primary prophylaxis, and they had to present, so if you remember the inclusion criteria of having to present within the first 24 hours, they were then randomized and included at that time point, and then they initiated Keppra as primary prophylaxis at 500 milligrams twice a day for the first 48 hours. After those 48 hours, they then um, transitioned the patients to like the equivalent oral dose to finish out the next 28 days for the first like 30 days of their treatment. They then began tapering the Keppra down, and so they would titrate them down to 250 milligrams twice a day for seven days, followed by 250 milligrams once a day for seven days. And the requirement for EEG monitoring for this study was that the EEG monitoring had to start within 24 hours of randomization, um, and it was required to be in place for monitoring of those subclinical seizures for at least 48 hours of this study. So just to orient you to the timeline, because I think this will be important when we talk about um, the results, but also the limitations of the study. If you think about how patients had symptom onset at hour zero, um, they had up until hour 24 to be included and randomized in this study. EEG monitoring had to start within 24 hours of that randomization. And so technically, EEG monitoring could start up to 48 hours after having those initial symptom onset from their intracerebral hemorrhage. So there is a potential delay to starting EEG monitoring in this study that I think is important to just keep in mind as we go through the results. For their outcomes, the primary outcome was the occurrence of one clinical or electrographic seizure within the first 72 hours after inclusion. They did look at a handful of secondary outcomes, um, the most notable of which are number of seizures seen on EEG, the duration of those seizures seen on EEG monitoring, change in NIHSS score, change in MRS score, and quality of life. 
They did also look at safety outcomes, um, which was the frequency of adverse events, the anxiety and depression scoring, and all-cause mortality. For their analysis, they did do a modified intention to treat analysis where all patients that were randomly assigned to treatment and also had that continuous EEG in place were candidates to be included in the primary outcome analysis. The safety analysis was an intention to treat analysis, and they did calculate that the sample size they would need would be 52 patients per group to achieve power for the study. And they did note statistical significance at a p-value of less than 0.05. Now moving into demographics and baseline characteristics of the patient population in this study, um, they did end up including only 50 total patients when they had needed originally 52 per group um, to achieve power. They did include patients from three different hospitals in France, and they did note that the trial was stopped early, unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was paused at that time. And then by the time the researchers were given the go-ahead to resume enrollment, um, all of the study medications had expired and they weren't able to resume uh, the study or enrolling more patients. When looking at the baseline characteristics between the two patient populations, there's definitely some differences that are worth noting between the two groups. The levetiracetam or the Keppra group was a little bit older in age at baseline at 77 years um, compared to a median age of 66 years in the placebo group. The Kepra group also had a higher pre-stroke MRS score where 79% kind of fell into this like bucket category of an MRS score of zero or one. Um, whereas the placebo group, 96% fell into that same category of having a pre-stroke MRS score of zero or one. So the Kepra group had a higher pre-stroke MRS score at baseline when compared to the placebo group. The Kepper group also had a higher percentage of patients receiving antiplatelet therapy, where 38% in the Kepper group received some sort of antiplatelet therapy compared to only 8% in the placebo group. 13% received um, direct oral anticoagulant therapy in the Kepper group compared to no patients in the placebo group. So just kind of pausing at that point and thinking about how the Kepper group at baseline was a little bit higher risk where they were older, they had a higher pre-stroke MRS score, and they also had a higher percentage of patients receiving both antiplatelet therapy and direct oral anticoagulant therapy. With that being said, the placebo group did have some higher risk factors at presentation as well, where the NIHSS score at baseline for the placebo group was higher at 12.5 compared to 7.5 in the Kepra group. The baseline hematoma volume of the placebo group as well was a little bit higher at 18 milliliters compared to nine in the Kepra group. So while the Kepra group seemed to be higher risk at baseline, the placebo group did seem to present with like a higher stroke severity, just given the NIHSS score and then the um, higher hematoma volume. The average GCS score and the severity of midline shift between the two groups was similar, where the GCS score was 15 in both the Kepra and the placebo group, um, and the midline shift severity was three millimeters in both groups. Now, breaking down the primary and secondary outcomes, the primary outcome was the number of patients that experienced either one seizure um, within 72 hours of either like a clinical seizure or an, a seizure noted on EEG. They did note that three patients in the Kepra group experienced a seizure in that first 72 hours compared to 10 patients in the placebo group, and that was deemed to be statistically significant with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.16. Of note, um, with this primary outcome, even though they considered both clinical and subclinical seizures to sort of meet that primary outcome, they did note that all of the seizures that were seen in that first 72 hours were subclinical seizures. So they actually didn't note any clinical seizures. All of them had to be like sort of caught on EEG monitoring. The next secondary outcomes that they looked at included the number of overall seizures seen on EEG monitoring during that like required 48 hour period of monitoring. In the Kepra group, there were six, six seizures documented in that 48 hours. And in the placebo group, there were 158 seizures documented in those 48 hours. And that had an adjusted odds ratio of 0 0.07, which was deemed to be statistically significant as well. And additionally, they looked at the median duration of seizures seen on EEG monitoring um, measured in seconds. And the median duration of seizures for the Kepra group was 67 seconds compared to 780 seconds in the placebo group, which was also deemed to be statistically significant with a p-value of 0.028. This is all to say that when comparing primary prophylaxis to placebo in this patient population, 
There were a higher number of patients experiencing seizures in the first 72 hours. And of the patients who were experiencing seizures, the group in the placebo experienced a higher number of seizures. And then the number of seizures was, or the, the duration of seizures for the patients who did experience seizures in those first 72 hours was lasting significantly longer. So the number of patients experiencing seizures increased, the number of overall seizures was higher, and then the duration was also higher in the placebo group. The researchers did also look at functional outcomes, and they looked at change in NIHSS score, self-reported quality of life on the stroke impact score. They evaluated patients at the 72-hour mark after inclusion, um, at the one-month mark after inclusion, and at the three-month mark after inclusion. And they found no statistical difference between receiving primary prophylaxis with Keppra um, compared to placebo at all of the time points. However, if you look at all of the time points, um, there was a general trend in favor of the Keppra group. When looking at the quality of life on the stroke impact scale, this is a scale, um, for those who don't know, that is like a patient reported scale out of 100 points. And the higher the score, um, the better the quality of life that the patient is reporting. They looked at the quality of life at three months, six months, six months, and 12 months. They found no difference between the two groups at any of those time points, but again, a general trend um, in favor of the Keppra group. And then lastly, when looking at change in MRS score, they found no difference between the groups at three, six, or 12 months. When looking at further secondary and safety outcomes, they did also look at clinical seizures within 30 days. So this kind of like totally removes the possibility of subclinical seizures and really just focuses in on those clinical seizures. And they found that 0% of patients in the Keppra group and 4% of patients in the placebo group had clinical seizures within that first month, um, which was not found to be statistically significant. The clinical seizures between 30 days and 12 months was also evaluated, and they found that 6% of patients in each group experienced clinical seizures during that time point, which was not found to be statistically significant. When looking at change in intracerebral hemorrhage volume at 72 hours, um, there was also no difference between the two groups, but it, was, it did sort of trend in favor of the Keppra group, where the change in volume actually like reduced a little bit compared to a little... Uh, very minor like increase in the placebo group. They also looked at serious adverse events and found that 22% in the Keppra group and 36% in the placebo group experienced severe adverse events, um, which was not found to be statistically significant. And the researchers didn't like attribute any of those serious adverse events um, to be due to like the meant that they received. And lastly, they, they looked at all cause mortality um, between the two groups in the like total time period and found that 13% of patients in the Keppra group and 24% of patients in the placebo group experienced all-cause mortality, which was not statistically significant, but again, trended in favor of the Keppra group. And so at this time, the authors concluded that when compared to placebo, Keppra is safe and possibly effective for prevention of primary seizures in acute spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. And while that is an accurate conclusion um, for the authors to report, there are some discussion and critique points that I think are important and sort of worthwhile to mention when interpreting the results of this study. First, this is definitely a relevant topic for emergency medicine pharmacists. We do have data that suggests benefit in the primary prophylaxis setting for certain instances of trauma hemorrhages, um, certain instances of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages, and oftentimes the, these findings sort of get extrapolated to other delineations of intracranial hemorrhages, um, but we don't have any strong we don't have like strong data at this point that really suggests a benefit in intracerebral hemorrhage patient populations to initiate primary prophylaxis. And so this is really like the first trial that randomized like treatment groups and evaluated the benefit in a primary prophylaxis setting. This is also the first randomized control trial to incorporate continuous EEG monitoring to really capture those subclinical seizures. Interestingly, the study found that when looking at the primary outcome, which was over a 72-hour time period, there were no clinical seizures noted between the two groups. And so if we, this study had not incorporated continuous EEG monitoring, they would have found no difference between the Keppra and the placebo group um, because there would have been no seizures in either group. But the use of continuous EEG monitoring does suggest that a lot of these early seizures that we see in intracerebral hemorrhage patient population are subclinical. And so the use of continuous EEG monitoring is appropriate at this time. Previous studies have also shown that there are potentially worse functional outcomes in early seizures, but that 
Unfortunately, the study kind of leaves something to be desired with this point, because while they found that there was a reduction in the number of patients experiencing seizures, um, the number of seizures experienced per patient and the re a reduction in total duration of seizures, this didn't really translate to uh, benefit and functional outcomes. There was no significant difference change in NIHSS score or MRS score or quality of life. And so we still are kind of left with this like unknown relationship between seizures occurring after an intracerebral hemorrhage and the relationship to the functional outcomes afterwards. And lastly, um, they found no difference in short or long-term functional outcomes or quality of life. And while those were secondary outcomes um, and this study wasn't powered to detect those, we still don't really have a definitive answer in if providing primary prophylaxis does benefit short or long-term functional outcomes. With all of that to be considered, um, there's definitely some limitations to also take into consideration, and one of which is that the study was definitely underpowered. They only achieved 48% of their like goal enrollment, and so that kind of it makes it difficult to really look at a lot of these outcomes and like form definitive conclusions on them, if you will, because we are missing a total a whole like 52% of the patient population that they aimed to include. There were also some demographic imbalances between the two patient populations in this study where the Keppra group seemed to be higher risk at baseline, but the placebo group had more severe NIHSS scores at baseline of a 12.5 compared to 7.5. And so while the placebo group experienced more seizures, more patients experiencing seizures and longer seizures, it's tough to say if that happened because they didn't receive primary prophylaxis or because they had more severe intracerebral hemorrhages at baseline. The next limitation I think is important to take into consideration where the initiation of EEG monitoring um, was allowed to occur up to 48 hours after that initial symptom onset of the intracerebral hemorrhage. And if you remember from um, the background slides of this presentation, the majority of seizures seen after an intracerebral hemorrhage occur within 24 to 72 hours after that initial insult to the brain. And so if we are delaying EEG monitoring up to 48 hours after that initial onset, we are potentially missing a pretty large window where we could capture um, a fair amount of seizures in that acute period where um, in this study, we are missing capturing all of those seizures. Similarly, the EEG monitoring was only required for 48 hours. And so the majority of seizures seen in this study were subclinical, and it's difficult to say really if the number of seizures that a patient was experiencing either before those 48 hours began or in the time period after those 48 hours of EEG monitoring. And lastly, um, they did exclude a severe intracerebral hemorrhage patient population. And so it's difficult to sort of extrapolate these findings to um, a more severe intracerebral hemorrhage patient. And so the main takeaway point from this trial is that primary seizure prophylaxis with levetiracetam resulted in a reduction in incidence of early seizures, but further data is still needed, unfortunately, to confirm clinical outcomes, such as improvement in functional outcomes, the effect on mortality, or the benefit um, in quality of life. And with that, I will take any questions that you all have. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.